you don't, if you're not a believer in, from the beginning, then it's hard to convince you to even try, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, so, that's a good but, point. But, but I'm happy to do it. If you think uh, the other way will cause more controversy, then uh, we'll, we can go the other way too. And for the discussion. So you're looking for controversy. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind controversy. I like it. <laughs> awesome. No, I, I think it's uh, either way is fine. I just wanted to. So do you th do any of you think uh, most of the audience would have never done a pneumatic or probably? So, so basically we do have a, a couple of uh, maybe more than 10 of our, our uh, retina specialists that has, have been trained in Canada. So they, okay. they've done it at a certain time in, the, in their career. And I'm sure they will be very interested in. in Audience would have never done a pneumatic, or probably there, there there are some. So, so basically, we do have a, a couple of uh, maybe more than ten of our. Were you hearing that? It's, it's just, yeah, it's like a, there's a delay. Oh, it was the streaming. I, I started streaming the meeting. Oh, there. I see. Okay, okay, got it. And actually, we have uh, one of our colleagues had uh, had a study about the experience in in Kekish and. And basically oh really okay uh, okay he's, he's gonna be around if i'm not mistaken so maybe i'll, oh. I'll ask him at a certain stage yeah that would be great time. so how's how's practice you guys are uh, you, you uh, your fellow just told me that you're still in in the in, in, in the con cautious uh, return space <laughs> yeah yeah pretty much i mean we're busy you're seeing a lot of patients but we're spacing everyone out and the waiting rooms are very uh, you know, not very busy. So, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, we're trying to keep it um, socially distanced, but, you know, keep our practice going also and keep patients without losing vision. You know, in, in the time over COVID, it was, it was amazing how many people had delayed presentations. You know, you're seeing now all the detachments and especially uh, diabetic, proliferative diabetic is pretty bad. Uh, a lot of very bilateral TRD kind of situations, you know, so. That's, yeah, we're not used to getting as much of that, you know, now and then. I'm sure you see that all the time, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe you're trying, you're, you're, you're living out experience. <laughs> yeah. I think we're almost a minute and then we can start. Okay, great. So you'll, you'll uh, go first and then you'll introduce and then I'll, I'll, uh, you, I'll when you, whenever you're ready, I'll start. Yeah, awesome. I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm, so you sent me what, the way you want me to present you. Do you want me to add yeah. anything else? Like, uh, like no, just that, uh, you know, I've had a lot of experience working with, uh, you know, a lot of people from Saudi and the Middle East. Uh, we have a lot of fellows, uh, fortunately, you know, who come and go. And uh, so it's nice to, you know, um, uh, give a shout out to those guys. Too, yeah, yeah. I'd be nice to shout out to them. And, uh, you know, just uh, that's that's about it. Awesome. So um, I think we're, we're almost... Uh, Yes, it's, it's exactly time now. Okay, just one second. Okay. Okay, so we'll start now. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to Kekish Global Education Forum. Uh, today, we're delighted uh, to have uh, Dr. Rajiv Mooney. Uh, Dr. Rajiv is from uh, St. Michael's uh, Hospital in Toronto, Canada, and he's the Assistant Professor and Vice Chair of the Clinical Research Department of Ophthalmology and Vision Science in the University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Rajiv has uh, a lot of experience uh, with uh, cases of uh, pneumatic retinopexy, and, 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 and he had a lot of publication in, in this uh, subject. He has also um, been training a lot of our, uh, our colleagues uh, that, that were from Saudi Arabia and from the Gulf region. And he has a very good relationship with, uh, with, with our region. So we're very delighted to have you, Dr. Rajiv, and, and the mic is yours. Great, thank you, Adele. Um, it's uh, really an honor to be uh, speaking to all of you today. Um, you know, this is uh, the, one of the unanticipated benefits of COVID has been that, you know, we were more connected than ever because, you know, I think it's very unlikely I'd be giving a talk in Saudi Arabia right now uh, if it wasn't for the, the you know, Zoom and, and the ability to, to do this. So uh, it's very nice to be able to reach out to you. And I, like Adele said, you know, we've had so many fellows from the Gulf region and, uh, you know, we have such a good relationship with, uh, with them uh, forever, you know, after they train. And so it's, it's really an honor to speak um, 
to, uh, to uh, ophthalmologists in that region. Um, uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about retinal detachment repair, which is one of my favorite uh, topics to discuss. I think it's why most of us go into uh, surgical retina in the beginning. You know, when you see uh, that you can do something to fix the retina, it's an amazing uh, experience, enlightening experience, and, and uh, you know, that captures many of us, and, and uh, that's why we choose this specialty. Uh, and it's, I know that's what really drew me to it. And today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, a paradigm shift in retinal detachment repair. And, you know, I know that a lot of what I'm going to say is probably very different than how you treat your retinal detachments. And, uh, you know, so today I'm asking that you, you keep an open mind. And because of the differences in how we all treat, you know, if you go from one part of the world to another, or even one center to another, it's completely different. You'll get a vit buckle in one place, you'll get a pneumatic in the other, you'll get a scleral buckle in one place, and it's, it's completely different. And this is the reason why we chose to study this area because the fact that there's so many treatments just tells you that there's many ways to fix a retinal detachment and they all probably work uh, more or less and you know we want to look at more subtle differences between them to see is there a difference in certain types of patients so i'm going to start by just showing you uh, this case here and you know this is a case uh, a very typical scenario, you know, three months post-op, I did a vitrectomy, the retina is attached, patient's 20-25, and I tell the patient, you know, you've done great, everything is good, the retina is fully attached, you're seeing 20-25, you were MAC off before, and, you know, uh, you don't need to see me anymore. Uh, but the patient looks at me and, you know, they say, well, no, I have a big problem here. I can't see well. I, things are, I see double. I see distorted. Everything, your head looks smaller than the rest of your body. I can't use both eyes at the same time. And so there's a disconnect in what we see and what we tell our patients and what they're experiencing. And I think that's the, one of the biggest messages for today that I want you to take away from this. So let's look a little bit more carefully at this patient. So first of all, we can measure the vertical and horizontal distortion. And you see that the vertical and horizontal distortion score of 0.4 is a moderate distortion. And the patient has significant anisoconia. So 24, it goes up to 30. Uh, anisoconia is a significant discrepancy. So this patient has significant image size difference. And this makes his eye, his 2025 eye, useless to him in, from a binocular perspective. And so this patient will tell you that he did not have a successful outcome, even though to us, the patient has had a successful outcome. And, uh, and this is kind of uh, an example of a patient. So this is a patient, another one, who had a macula off retinal detachment, superior break, 12 o'clock, as you can see, and there's some lattice inferiorly. And two months following, uh, sorry, two weeks following a pneumatic retinopexy, the retinal break is attached, the retina is attached, the patient has done well. And in our experience in Toronto, doing uh, lots of pneumatic retinopexies, what we've always been surprised at is how well the patients see after. The patients, uh, the way I think of pneumatic retinopexy is kind of going back in time. The bubble can block the tear and allow the fluid to reabsorb. And it's like going back in time to when you had just the retinal tear. And when you have a retinal tear, we don't do surgery, we do laser for that. And so that's why we put a bubble to go back in time to when you just have a tear. And then we do laser retinopexy to treat the tear. And we're always surprised at how these patients um, react and many of them act as if nothing's been done to their eye. As if you, you know, those patients you see follow up uh, horseshoe tear, uh, they, they have those types of uh, outcomes. And so, you know, there's a disconnect between what the whole world typically does for retinal detachment surgery and, and perhaps what the outcomes are. And so, you know, as we all know, minimally invasive vitrectomy surgery is the, the way to fix most things retina right now, you know, it, and it has to do with uh, these amazing uh, machines that we have that have cut rates of 15,000 and 20,000. The machines keep getting better. We have small gauge instruments and it's really an elegant and efficient way to treat retinal detachments. But that said, there hasn't been a single trial that's shown a benefit of vitrectomy over scleral buckle or pneumatic retinopexy from a functional outcome uh, for retinal detachment repair. And so is 
convenience and the ease and the elegance of the technique is one thing, but the functional outcomes for patients is another thing. And so we undertook a randomized clinical control trial to answer this question. What is better uh, from a visual perspective, from distortion perspective, from a, a visual function questionnaire perspective for patients undergoing pneumatic retinopexy versus vitrectomy? And we randomized almost 200 patients to these treatments. Now, the patients had to meet certain specific criteria, which we'll talk about later. But in summary, the PIVOT trial showed that patients who had pneumatic retinopexy had significantly better visual acuity at every time point by up to 10 letters at three and six months and about four to five letters at uh, one year. And just to give you an idea, when we looked at the outcomes with Lucentis or a Flibercep, we're seeing those kind of changes, seven or eight letters difference. So this is a mean difference. Some patients do much, much better than five letters, and some patients may not may have the same outcomes as vitrectomy. But on average, there's a five-letter ETDRS improvement. But that, to me, is not the biggest finding in the PIVOT trial. This is the biggest finding in the PIVOT trial. It's that when you undergo pneumatic retinopexy, you have less vertical metamorphopsia with pneumatic compared to vitrectomy. Never has there been a way or a documented way of minimizing distortion until now. This study has shown us that not only do people get vertical distortion less with pneumatic, but also the severity of the vertical distortion is less. And so it makes you wonder why. Why is there a difference between vitrectomy and pneumatic retinopexy from this perspective? And if you look, this is the proportion. So you see there's about a 20% uh, more patients have distortion in the vitrectomy group. So the first thing we did is we looked at the OCTs. So if you look at the OCT, we found that patients who had vitrectomy had significantly more disruption of the outer retinal layers compared to pneumatic retinopexy. And, and we're still doing a more detailed analysis and we'll be publishing this soon. But there was some suggestion that the integrity of how the retina reattaches is different between the two groups as shown from randomized clinical trial data. So let's go back now and look at that patient. This is the one on the left who had the vitrectomy. And I'm going to show you another patient on the right who had a pneumatic retinopexy. They both look good, 20, 20, 20, 25. It's the same thing, more or less. And the patients are both seeing well from a visual acuity perspective. But now let's look a little bit deeper. That patient who was three months post-op that I showed you, if you look very carefully on the fundus autofluorescence imaging, we see that there's a what we call a retinal vessel printing. And this signifies the location of where the retinal vessel was before the, pneumatic, uh, before the vitrectomy compared to where it is now. And you can see that there's been a change or a movement up that vessel. And I'm going to show you more examples. But basically, a light bulb basically went off when we saw this because we realized that perhaps the differences in functional outcomes that we're seeing have some relation to this phenomenon of retinal displacement. And could there be a difference uh, between the two treatments? And not surprisingly, when you have less displacement, the OCT findings also tend to be better. So you have less disruption of the outer retinal layers. So let's look at the patient who had pneumatic retinopexy. And if we look at their fundus autofluorescence, they had no vertical and horizontal distortion, no anisoconia. And in this specific case, there was no uh, displacement of the retina. It, the autofluorescence is pristine, showing us that the retina has been reopposed as close as possible to its original location compared to the case of vitrectomy that I showed you. And not surprisingly, the OCT showed a better integrity of the outer retina. So the first point that I want you to take home today is when you look into the eye and you say that the retina is attached and everything looks good and you tell your patient that you've done a good job and that they're doing well, it, it's not exactly accurate. Anatomic reattachment is not enough for you to call it a success. To, for me, to, be, to call it a success, not only does the retina have to be attached, but you also have to have no significant displacement of the retina and you should have good functional outcomes. That is what we call success. This is another patient who has a retinal vessel printing. You can see very prominent inferior displacement of the retinal uh, vessels following vitrectomy surgery. 
So this historical focus of primary reattachment rate, you know, I want to do the procedure that's going to reattach the retina, that is, a, is an older concept now, and we have to think differently about functional outcomes. What's giving patients the best possible visual outcome? So anatomic reattachment, I think of as the bottom of the pyramid. That's the most basic requirement. But you also need to have microstructural and macrostructural integrity of the anatomic reattachment so that you know that you've done as good of a job putting the retina back in place. And this will lead to better functional outcomes for patients. So the next study that we did after the PIVOT trial, along with our colleagues at Newcastle and in Hamilton, uh, it was a multi-center retrospective study where 238 eyes from different centers who have different ways of treating retinal detachments were followed. And at three months, we obtained fundus autofluorescence imaging. And guess what? The proportion of patients with retinal displacement was 44.4% in vitrectomy versus 7% with pneumatic retinopexy. And this number of 44.4% is very consistent in the literature. There's been, very, uh, there's been several studies that have shown similar rates of retinal displacement, and it always ends up in the, that 40 to 50% range. So now we know that we have two different treatments that have different integrity of anatomical reattachment. If you do this procedure, vitrectomy, you're going to have a much higher risk of displacing the retina versus in pneumatic retinopexy. And we coined these terms called HERA and LIRA. HERA means a high integrity retinal attachment, which is what you get when you do pneumatic retinopexy more often. And LIRA or low integrity retinal attachment is more common with vitrectomy. This is another example of a profound case of retinal displacement where you can clearly see that the retina has been shifted inferiorly and temporally in a case where we use perfluorocarbon liquid. And this would be an example of LIRA. Now let's go back to the basic mechanism about why. Why is this happening with vitrectomy surgery? So here I'm showing you an animation and at the end of surgery, we know that there's significant subretinal fluid often, even if it's microscopic amounts. And as the patient positions and lifts their head after surgery, we see that the retina gets that that fluid has a bulk flow to the periphery. And as the fluid flows under a thin membrane, take your hand and pass it under any thin membrane, like a bed sheet or a, a tissue paper or something, you'll see that there's stretching that's occurring. And th this is what we believe is causing the stretching due to the large large buoyant force of a large gas bubble in vitrectomy surgery. And here's another cross-sectional video showing that as the fluid gets displaced to the periphery, this point here gets stretched or displaced due to that flow of fluid. And this is occurring because of the buoyant force or the contact force of the bubble in vitrectomy acting over a larger area than you get with pneumatic retinopexy and with a larger force because of the size of the bubble. Now, let's compare that to pneumatic retinopexy. We inject a very small bubble into the vitreous cavity. There is no, there's much less significant force being applied by that bubble to the retina. We like to do steamrolling to reduce the amount of fluid under the retina, but that final retinal reattachment is not occurring because of the large bubble pushing the, ret, uh, the fluid somewhere else. It's, up, it's the natural reabsorption of fluid by the RPE pump, and that leads to a more natural settlement of the retina. It allows the photoreceptors to interdigitate nicely with the RPE, and this is why we believe that the functional outcomes are better. Uh, with pneumatic retinopexy. You know, we always talk about this wallpaper analogy, and we want to put the wallpaper back on as, as best we can in retinal detachment. But it's not enough just to put it on and it's wrinkled and it's distorted. and That's not a good job. You want to do a good job where you put the wallpaper back on nice and smoothly. And this is the paradigm shift that we have to have in our specialty, where it's not enough just to say that it's attached. In conclusion, pneumatic first line had better visual acuity and metamorphopsia results from a randomized controlled trial. There are several studies now that we've done another one that's a prospective study that we haven't published yet, but that have demonstrated that pneumatic retinopexy is associated with a high integrity retinal attachment, and you just cannot get those numbers with vitrectomy. Anatomic success requires you to also have HERA, and the concept of integrity is now going to lead to modifications in vitreoretinal surgical techniques, in my opinion, which will lead to better functional outcomes for our patients. 
thank you very much. And that is the end of my first talk. Thank you very much, uh, Rajiv. I'm, I really appreciate uh, that, that you, you took it in, in this uh, matter because the, the second talk is, is where, where I think a lot of people will be interested to, to, uh, to have a discussion. So I'm going to leave the, the discussion to the end. I just want to remind everyone that the, the floor is open for any questions uh, that you can post here. And we're going to uh, share at the end some of the experience of, of, of uh, new adopters of, of pneumatic retinopexy. And I think uh, it would be interesting if you also, if the audience also give their take on that. Uh, you're, you're welcome to start your second talk. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Adele. So, you know, now that I've hopefully convinced you to try pneumatic retinopexy, if you haven't, now I'm gonna uh, go over a discussion about how best to, uh, to do pneumatic retinopexy. And uh, before we start, you know, I should tell you, I've met Adele through uh, this uh, chat group that we have. It's a global chat group for pneumatic retinopexy. And we have about 70 doctors from all over the world. Uh, and today, actually, a few of them um, uh, will be uh, later presenting some of their first cases. And so you can talk to Adele or email me, and we will add you to the group. Because what's very unique about that group is that patients, people who have never done pneumatic retinopexy, can basically post uh, photos or, or their case, and you almost get live feedback from uh, very experienced uh, people who've done pneumatic retinopexy. So it's almost like being in fellowship and you know, you're, someone telling you step-by-step step what to do. And so we have um, a, a very great group uh, for that, and, and uh, I welcome you all to join if you're interested. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about the indications and the case selection. Then we're gonna talk about surgical technique, managing complications, and vitrectomy after failed pneumatic, which is, does happen, so we need to know how to deal with that. So let's start by basically saying, if you are starting doing pneumatic retinopexy, what is the standard criteria? So Paul Ternambi, um, uh, the late Paul Ternambi, did the pneumatic retinopexy trial, and he identified patients who had a single break or multiple breaks within one clock hour of detached retina. Now, he, in his trial, did not allow any pathology in attached retina. And that, to us, was something that was very limiting because almost all patients have some lattice or they might have some atrophic hole or other tear in attached retina. And so um, this was the standard criteria, but we moved beyond that in the PIVOT trial. So we included patients, again, in detached retina, they had to have breaks within one clock hour. However, you could have extensive lattice degeneration, even 360 lattice. You could have multiple breaks, even large breaks in attached attached retina. That was allowed within the trial. And what we do is we treat those patients with laser retinopexy uh, before we inject the gas bubble, and then we inject the gas bubble uh, and position the patient. Now, these are what we call extended criteria. So these are patients who had breaks that are inferior to eight o'clock or multiple breaks spanning multiple quadrants. Now, when we, you've done thousands of pneumatics, you know, you know how to do these cases, but I don't necessarily recommend this to be your first case. You know, these are cases that after you're, you're comfortable with the technique, you can achieve high success rates. But we have not, uh, you know, yet published on the randomized data for these kind types of cases as the trial is still ongoing. Uh, so, you know, at, I can't convincingly tell you that th it's better to do this, but uh, we do uh, pneumatics on these types of cases at, at this time. So I'd like to show you my technique. I've read about it in a, a very old book. So this is a step-by-step -step technique. So the Negative first thing. So the first thing we do is we do a topical anesthetic or topical Negative lidocaine. And the next step is an anterior chamber paracentesis. So here, what we're doing is we're applying, uh, using the needle, it's a 30 gauge needle on a TV syringe. And we are uh, basically entering inferiorly over iris. And I use the plunger for constant pressure and we express as much fluid as we can. Then we mark about four millimeters posterior to the limbus and you always want to inject superiorly. And we're we add a 0.3 to what we took out and we inject 0.6 cc's of uh, SF6 if we took out 
Then we want to look at the eye. We want to make sure that the central retinal artery is perfused and visualized and that the pressure is under control. Now, sometimes, again, we have to re-tap afterwards to lower the pressure. So I'm using the plunger for counter pressure. And with the plunger removed, I'm allowing fluid to go back into the syringe. Again, I recheck to make sure that the central retinal artery is perfused. And then we give the patient a prescription for drops. Uh, usually we use prednisone and uh, antibiotics for about uh, five days. So this is that patient that I just showed you who I did the pneumatic retinopexy on. Now, if you look at the top left, you see two hours after just putting the patient face down, the retina is now mostly reattached. And then you can see at 24 hours, it's almost completely reattached. And we were able to get serial optos photos so we can document the very rapid resolution. This is the power of the RPE pump. You know, Robert Mockamer, who uh, basically developed vitrectomy, once said that the retina wants to reattach. All you have to do is not do too much to it. You know, and so that, that to me means a lot because it's telling us that, you know, let the RPE pump reabsorb and the fluid and let the RPE pump do the work. All you have to do is close the brake somehow. And so here you can see at one week and two weeks, there's a complete reattachment of the retina. Now, what gases do we use? My preference is to use sulfur hexafluoride gas for several reasons. Number one, it expands very quickly. C3F8 takes four days to reach its maximal size. By using a gas bubble that expands um, fast, you can determine if pneumatic retinopexy is going to work. If you have to wait four days to reach the maximal gas bubble size, you've waited four days to really get to the point where then you can say, okay, now let's see if the bubble is gonna be big enough and if it'll work. So I like the fact that SF6 expands quickly. The other thing is in a non-vitrectomized eye, if you have a large gas bubble of C3F8 there for 38 days, I worry about the possibility of getting additional retinal breaks. And so I like the fact that sulfur hexafluoride expands quickly, it's in and it's out. Once the job is done, you don't, it, you don't need it anymore. And, and it's good that it reabsorbs fast in about 12 days. Now, when you inject ga uh, gas into the eye, there's a few tips here. You want to take a 3cc syringe with pure SF6 gas with a 30 gauge needle. You enter through the pars plana so that the tip is halfway in, and then you pull back so that the tip is barely in. And so what you're doing here is you're pulling it back and then injecting the gas bubble into this ever expanding bubble. And that allows you to maintain one bubble so that you don't get fish eggs, which is what you want to avoid. I very strongly believe in the steamrolling maneuver. So you have to put the patient face down initially for six hours if they're macula off and four hours if they're macula on. And then you raise their head 30 degrees every hour. And what this does is it expresses fluid through the retinal break so that the overall amount of fluid that's there to be displaced and that's there to be reabsorbed by the RPE pump is less. We instruct the patients to use topical steroids and antibiotics for a week. We position for about nine to 10 days as much as possible. I usually tell them as 23 out of 24 hours a day, as much as you can maintain the position. I know that not all patients will do that. And even if they do a lot less, usually it works. But the more they position, the higher you're putting the odds in their favor. We want to ensure that the patient and the family understands the importance of positioning. And this, this is really critical. You know, it's interesting. One thing when I give talks about pneumatic retinopexy, people say, oh, you know, in my country, no one will do this. It's impossible. You know, no patient is going to position. They won't listen to instructions. They won't show up. And, you know, in Canada, we have a very multicultural population, people from all over the world. And it's amazing how patients will do whatever you advise them. They want the best outcomes for themselves. And so I encourage you, if you spend time, you talk to them, you explain to them what's going on and, and why this will lead to a better outcome, patients will buy in and they'll do it. You want to tell people to avoid lying on their back. So this is an example of a case where you had a superior RD, you had a break at three o'clock. So we lasered that break before firsthand, we put three rows around it. Then we inject the gas bubble and we position the patient head elevated. And then we lasered those breaks. 
This is another video where I'm going to show you another case of some other factors or other kind of aspects of uh, how I perform pneumatic retinal epoxy. And so again, it's a superior retinal break. We position the patient uh, initially, and I'm here I actually show them how I want them to position. So I show them face down, then I show them 30 degrees for every hour, and I'm explaining this to the wife to, so that she understands what the patient needs to do. The patient came back the next day, the retina was mostly reattached. There was some residual fluid, which is not uncommon after pneumatic retinopexy. On that day, I did laser retinopexy to that superior retinal break, and then I followed the patient over time. With laser retinopexy, you can use subconjunctival anesthesia, and that kind of helps. And sometimes it's over a couple of days that you have to do the laser. But here you can see a nice big bubble, an attached retina, and this patient did very well. And here you can see the laser through the gas bubble. I'm going to now show you some other cases of what I would call extreme pneumatics. These are pneumatics that I would recommend when you have significant experience, but we do very commonly in Canada. So this is a 15-year-old boy with a max splitting detachment from 9 to 2 o'clock with a dialysis, a superior dialysis, and this usually would be treated with scleral buckle by most people. Uh, however, we know for several reasons, pneumatic retinopexy in these types of cases when there's no PVR works very well in children. You know, some uh, retinal surgeons will say in a pediatric detachment, all you have to do is touch the eye and it goes away. And it's true because the RPE pump is so strong. As soon as you close the break with any mechanism, basically, the retina reattaches because that RPE pump is, is so powerful. And so we know that in children, pneumatic retinopexy works very well. And this is the next day you see that the retina is fully attached and at, uh, several days later it remained attached. This is another case, a bullous inferior retinal detachment but a temporal retinal break. We injected the gas bubble at 1027 in the morning. At 144 you see that the bullous inferior detachment is much better. It's almost attached. And the next day, you see, or, uh, sorry, the same day at 337, it was better. And the next day, it was fully reattached. We lasered the retinal break. This is another case where many would not consider, they say, oh, there's an inferior detachment, there could be some other pathology. As long as you do a careful preoperative examination and identify the location of the retinal break, it doesn't matter where the fluid is. It's all about the location of the retinal break. The RPE pump will do the rest of the work. What about this case, a patient who has a bullous nasal retinal detachment in a young myopic female? You can see that there's a horseshoe tear here, very posterior. So we injected a gas bubble, and on the same day, at 143, we see a significant improvement, and at 410, the same day, again, an improvement. And by the next day, fully attached, we lasered that nasal retinal break, and the patient did very well, never requiring any surgery. Now, what about complications? With any good procedure, we know that we can get complications. And, and part of being uh, the art of pneumatic retinopexy is really understanding how to deal with those complications. So the, the worst thing that can happen, one of the worst things is that you get subretinal gas. And you can generally avoid this by avoiding fish eggs. So you wanna try to get one single large gas bubble in order to um, uh, prevent these bubbles from going under the retina. The reason a large gas bubble doesn't go under the retina is because of the property of surface tension. Surface tension creates an elastic film-like layer on the surface of the bubble, and that prevents it from going under the retina. This is an example where you get lots of fish eggs. Now, usually it's not a problem, actually. If you get fish, fish eggs, often they will coalesce over the first 24 hours. We usually tell patients, if you get a lot of fish eggs, to stay face down for the first full day. And then we have them come back and we see that the bubbles have coalesced. Most of the time with the regular sized retinal breaks, it's very rare even with fish eggs that it'll go under the retina, but sometimes it can. And if that happens, then you can try to use a depressor and to milk the bubbles out through the retinal break. Um, and if that doesn't work, if there's small bubbles and they're away from the break, it's not a problem. The only time that it is a problem is if you have significant gas opening up the tear and causing uh, the retina to not reattach. And in that case, you need to do a vitrectomy. 
There's also something called prehyloidal gas or the space of petite, which is a little space between the anterior hyloid and the eye wall. If you inject the gas by chance in this area due to an anterior placement of the needle, you can sequester the gas bubble in this space. Very rarely that can lead to large tears, but most of the time, if you put the patient face down, it'll break through the anterior hyloid face and it'll, uh, it'll um, uh, go to the back of the eye. You know, I would say this happens once every three, four years, and we do you know, hundreds and hundreds of pneumatics. So it's very rare, uh, but when it occurs, usually the prone positioning will be sufficient. Very rarely would I say you'd have to do a vitrectomy or do something to remove the, the gas bubble. Now, persistent subretinal fluid is, is a very, this is where the, again, the art of pneumatic retinopexy comes in. You know, we commonly see persistent subretinal fluid in cases of chronic detachments. And the important thing about persistent subretinal fluid, you have to ask yourself one question. Is the fluid getting better? Is it getting worse? Or is it staying the same? If it's getting better or it's staying the same, you should never proceed to surgery. In fact, it can be more complicated because you have to then create a retinotomy to drain the fluid, and now you're creating inferior retinotomies, which is not what you want to do. The only time you proceed with a surgery for a failed pneumatic is when you're convinced that the fluid is getting worse. If the fluid is getting worse, then you know that there is an open break somewhere and that that's when you should do surgery. So it's important to do a careful examination to identify new breaks. Now, sometimes you might be surprised that, you know, this patient had a total RD and let's say I, there was a supratemporal retinal break and I tamponaded that break and there's still fluid and I've lasered the break. Well, I look around now I see it. Now I see a nasal break, a new nasal break that wasn't there or that I missed. And now I can reposition the patient. Sometimes I can add a gas bubble and then you can attach it. So you can sometimes salvage the situation, but sometimes when there's worsening fluid and you don't see it, uh, the cause of it or you see an inferior break, then you proceed with surgery. And this is another important point. One way to get in trouble with pneumatic retinopexy, people have said, oh, I've seen bad outcomes when I've tried. It's because when you have a failure, you wait too long to repair it. Once you have a failure, you treat it like something that has to be done relatively soon. I would suggest that within 72 hours is, is optimal. Waiting a week after a failed pneumatic is one way to get in trouble. I'm now gonna show you a, a video about vitrectomy after pneumatic retinopexy. So one of the important things in a phacic patient, you don't want the patient lying on their back, even in the pre-op area, even for, even for half an hour, 45 minutes. You want them to, you tell them to be face down until the second that they see you in the OR because the nurse will often say, oh, lie on your back, let me put the IV in. And before you know it, it's been an, an hour on their back and you've lost your view through the lens. The first thing you wanna do is you try to clear the vitreous from the cannulas and try to remove the gas bubble that way. If that doesn't work, then you go into the bubble with the vitrector and make sure that you're always keeping the cutter in the bubble so that you never touch the lens. Then we do a very careful 360 uh, peripheral vitrectomy with scleral indentation because the bubble can sometimes compress the vitreous and you want to avoid uh, PBR situations. So you want to do a careful peripheral shave in all patients uh, undergoing vitrectomy. This patient happened to have an inferior retinal break, which we treated uh, with endodiathermy and we drained through that retinal break and then we uh, reattached the retina. And the rest of the vitrectomy is pretty standard. So really the main thing is the careful 360 vitrectomy and um, avoiding contact of the bubble with the lens. This is the downside of uh, doing this in a hospital. <laughs> I just... No, it's, it's fine. I, I think we, we hear you fine. <laughs> okay. Okay. We really so, appreciate you took the time uh, during this busy day. But. What's that? <laughs> yeah, we'll take a, a, just a, a second here to a break. But I'm, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over some of the myths about pneumatic retinopexy because this is kind of one of those things where um, you, this is one of those situations where, you, you know, you'll get a lot of, um, you know, opinions about pneumatic retinopexy. And a lot of those things don't pan out uh, when you look at the actual data. I hope it's not, not something serious. 
<laughs> yeah. It's funny, I haven't, there hasn't been this many announcements in the last month, you know, and within this 20 minutes, we've had three announcements. Okay. Are you able to still hear me talk? Or? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, you can, you can hear me. Okay. I hope okay. that you can, it's not really bothering you. Uh, no, it's okay. It's okay. So one of the common myths is uh, pneumatic retinopexy does not work as you do not relieve the vitreous traction on the brake. So that's true. You know, we're not doing anything to relieve the traction on the horseshoe tear. However, uh, we know that when we see patients who have horseshoe tears, we don't do vitrectomy for that. We don't do buckle for that. So the concept that you're not relieving traction is not a sufficient reason to not do pneumatic retinopexy because we know that for retinal tears, we don't need to relieve traction. And like I was saying, pneumatic retinopexy is like the bubble going back in time to when you had a retinal tear and then you're lasering it. So if laser works for a horseshoe tear, it should work for a pneumatic retinopexy. The other thing is that, uh, is that people say that pneumatic retinopexy is not a long-term solution as the retina will eventually redetach anyway. Well, we know now from two randomized control trials from uh, the Paul Ternambi paper, the pneumatic retinopexy trial, and the PIVOT trial with involving almost 500 patients that there has been no significant redetachment after three months. So when we looked at the pivot trial results, there was a one to two percent uh, rate of redetachment after pneumatic retinopexy, and a two to three percent rate after vitrectomy after the time uh, three month time point. So you do have a very durable treatment with pneumatic retinopexy. The other common myth is that pneumatics that fail will have a worse outcome. You'll have high risk of PVR and that you'll, patients will lose their vision. We now know from, again, two randomized control trials that those who fail initial pneumatic still had a good visual acuity outcome. In fact, as good as the primary vitrectomy group. So even when you have a failed pneumatic, you do just as well as having a vitrectomy from the beginning. And that's something that's very important that, uh, and important to tell patients that they haven't lost anything when you have a failed pneumatic. If it works, you have a better outcome. You have less morbidity. You have better visual acuity and visual function results. If it doesn't work, you have the same outcome with uh, a vitrectomy procedure. What about the follow-up? How many visits do these patients need? So in the randomized control trial, Patients who had pneumatic retinopexy had about 10.8 visits versus in vitrectomy, there was 9.6 visits. You have to remember that patients with vitrectomy have worse visual acuity. They get cataracts. They come back and they need to have cataract surgery and post-op visits for their cataract. And so when you add up all the visits, there was a one visit extra for pneumatic retinopexy compared to vitrectomy. We also looked at the quality of life overall, uh, their uh, general overall quality of life, and there was no difference between pneumatic retinopexy and vitrectomy. We also looked at uh, the visual function questionnaires, and we just published our results in JAMA, that patients who have pneumatic retinopexy have better visual function in the first six months compared to vitrectomy surgery. Now, this is the most common reason people say they don't want to do pneumatic retinopexy. They say they want a higher single operation success rate. They want to do one procedure and they want that to work no matter what, whether the retina is displaced or not displaced, regardless of what the visual acuity is, they want to do one procedure. So I want to look at that specific argument more carefully. Let's look at the reattachment rate. It was 93% with vitrectomy and 81% with pneumatic retinopexy. Here we see that the difference in the success rate is 12% of reattachment rate. I shouldn't say success, reattachment. And that difference of 12%, if you look at the number needed to treat, is 8.33. In other words, if you believe in doing less surgery because you don't want failures, and you are suggesting that doing vitrectomy first is the way to go, what you're saying is that you're going to do eight vitrectomies to save one of those patients from needing a second procedure. So those seven patients didn't need vitrectomy from the beginning. Only one patient really needed a second vitrectomy. Uh, and no, not only that, you're going to expose all of those patients to requiring cataract surgery in their one eye and possibly their other eye if they have, anti if they have the uh, anisometropia. So from a surgery perspective, doing less surgery, pneumatic retinopexy also makes sense. 
So in conclusion, patients receiving pneumatic retinopexy as first-line treatment have better visual acuity results from randomized controlled trial data, and they have less morbidity compared to patients receiving vitrectomy. And pneumatic as per the pivot trial criteria should be considered and offered to patients before vitrectomy in both phakic and pseudophakic patients. And I'm just going to sh uh, show you this picture again, and I want you to remember this picture. When you see your patient who has retinal reattachment after vitrectomy surgery, get an autofluorescence. And if you're seeing significant retinal displacement, I want you to just think twice about the next time when you see a patient who has a single superior tear and consider doing something less invasive to avoid this outcome. This is a case of a 69-year-old pseudophagic female. Now, what is the solution the to vitrectomy? I'd like to show this new concept that we just with uh, retinal break at 12 have recently presented the at the AO. The patient underwent a 23-gauge pars plane of vitrectomy with a core vitrectomy followed by peripheral vitreous shave with 360-degree scleral indentation. Here you can see a 12 o'clock break with scleral indentation. With careful depressed examination inferiorly, we found a retinal break in attached retina, which was treated with endolaser retinopexy. Endodiathermy was then applied to the superior retinal break to assist with subsequent visualization. In this specific case, no air fluid exchange was performed. All cannulas were then removed, and the wounds were closed with 7-0 vitral suture. The retina was left detached. How can we minimize retinal displacement, which is so common after vitrectomy surgery? One approach is to allow the RPE pump to reabsorb the fluid. We performed an anterior chamber paracentesis to remove as much aqueous as we could from the anterior chamber. We then injected 0.6 cc's of pure sulfur hexafluoride gas. Immediately after surgery, the retina was mostly reattached with the face down positioning for six hours, followed by steamrolling to the head elevated position. On day one, postoperatively, the patient underwent laser retinopexy. The to other the option is to break. do cryo. And at four at days the time postoperatively, of there was no retinal displacement. At one month, the retina was attached with a high integrity retinal reattachment and no retinal displacement. Thank you. So this is our approach. If you need to do a vitrectomy surgery, the problem with vitrectomy that's causing displacement is large gas bubble size. Even if you do a 50% air fluid exchange or a 40%, you still get it. And really what we're working on now is minimizing the size of the gas bubble to the least amount possible. And we're doing a prospective study with this technique involving almost 70 patients where we will uh, be using C3F8, 0.3 cc, so even the smallest possible volume. And what we uh, uh, believe is that by avoiding a large gas bubble, we can greatly minimize the risk uh, of displacement with vitrectomy surgery in simple detachments. Now, I still would recommend pneumatic retinopexy for many reasons in patients meeting pivot trial criteria, but there are specific situations where I like this approach. For example, a patient with vitreous hemorrhage, and I go in, I remove the vitreous, and I find a single break with a detachment. This is a patient that meets pivot trial criteria, even though they had vitreous hemorrhage and I couldn't see that. So I did the vitrectomy, and now I then convert to pneumatic retinopexy by doing this minimal gas vitrectomy technique. Another example would be a patient where there's no visible break, but under wide field viewing, you can examine and find the little retinal break that caused the detachment, and you see that it's localized. You cryo the break and put a small gas bubble like you do in pneumatic retinopexy. Another example might be where you see a superior break and an inferior break that's suspicious. Oh, maybe there's a break at six, I'm not sure. You go in and you confirm that there's no inferior break and only the superior break or the temporal break or you know, one break is causing the detachment. Then you do this to minimize the risk of retinal displacement. There's other examples where you have a small pupil, capsular phimosis, difficult view. Again, you can use this technique. So when patients are not candidates for pneumatic for other reasons, you can often use this technique with vitrectomy to achieve a higher integrity attachment. And so this is now part of my armamentarium for retinal detachment repair, um, in addition to scleral buckle and vitrectomy and pneumatic retinopexy. Uh, so with that, I'm going to end. I'm going to pass it back to Adele. And uh, uh, 
Adele, uh, we, have, um, we have two uh, uh, or three presenters who have done their first pneumatic retinopexy cases on our chat group. Uh, and I also, if you could add if uh, Mahmoud Al-Rabia and uh, Mustafa Hanout, if they're there, uh, they also, uh, I asked them to kind of help uh, also, uh, you know, as experienced pneumatic Yeah, if you could add them as the panel and we can have the three cases and, and discuss. Absolutely. So um, I'm just going to st start the first case. It's going to be by uh, Dr. Saud Jenny. He's our fellow here. But I'd like you to stop sharing your presentation for him to start. This is a case of a 16. Uh, just from, from share screen, you can just uh, stop sharing from there. Oh, yeah. Okay. From here, the green one. Just pull this. Okay. Stop sharing. Okay. I can Perfect. see, uh, yeah. I'm not sure if I can see Mahmoud. Okay, uh, Dr. Saud, uh, we can hear you now. If you want to uh, start playing your presentation. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv, for an informative presentation. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Adil, for letting me for this opportunity to share my very simple experience with my first case of uh, pneumatic retinopics. So this is 45 years old uh, female who came with us with RRD macular off for one day with the vision of hand motion. Uh, this was her color fundus. As we can see, there was uh, one superior temporal horseshoe tear. Also, if you can see, there is some area of lettuce, uh, the superior nasal area. So uh, we were deciding, me and Dr. Adel, whether we go for this patient for pneumatic retinopexy or for Bart's plan of treatment. But we were having some issue. So first of thing, the best is when I see nurse, and she said, if I want a surgery, I want it under GA during this era of COVID-19. Plus, she came on the weekends, so we need to have, or we need to wait for two, two more or three days. Plus, she turned out that she's COVID-19 positive. Her husband also is COVID-19 positive. So we were forced to do pneumatic retrovixi. So me and Dr. Adil, we proceed and did for her pneumatic retrovixi. She was last patient in our office at that time. And she proceed, we proceed pneumatic retrovixi. We saw her after three days. Retina was totally attached. No subretinal fluids. So we augmented laser at the superior temporal area. And plus also the superior nasal area here around the lattice. We augmented laser. Then we see her after 14. The written was totally attached, VA was 2040, and the patient is happy, and we went fine. So it was very simple procedure, quick. We did less than five minutes. Uh, I think we could, this could be a perfect solution, or at least temporary solution to this COVID-19 era. And the end was everybody's happy. She was happy, we were happy. Hospital staff and everyone was happy that we did not admit this patient. And this is my simple experience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adi. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. That, that, that's a great example. And it highlights how, you know, uh, from, you know, in some countries, it maybe doesn't matter, but health economics and the, uh, the access to the OR and um, utilizing resources is going to become a greater and greater issue for all of us. And I never like to use the cost reason uh, to promote pneumatic retinopexy. I don't think that's the right reason to do it. Uh, the, I strongly believe that I'm doing what's better for patients, that patients are going to get better results. And, and that's why we do it. But in, in, it also has many practicalities, as Saud has very elegantly shown, that you know, in this era where you want to minimize GA and minimize uh, you know, operating room uh, usage and, um, and allow patients to be done as outpatients outside of a hospital facility, uh, those are great advantages for the pneumatic retinopexy. Uh, I think I have Mustafa on, so if you want to share your your, uh, your your thoughts as well. I'm going to uh, move uh, to um, Dr. Rodrigo Arana, and he's, uh, he's uh, training in, in Colombia. He's originally from, uh, from Bolivia, and he will share one of his cases as well. It's the first case that he's done, so uh, I'm going to give you the, the opportunity to share. So, so can you share your, your presentation now? Yes, thank you very much for the opportunity. I will share now my, my screen. Thanks, Dr. Mooney, Dr. Adele, for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Can you all see my screen? Yes, that's yes, quite, quite clear. Okay, perfect. So I'll go and present this. So this is my very short experience with, P, with retinopexy, with pneumatic retinopexy. This is my first case, a 50-year-old male, one-week progressive vision loss on the left eye. 
He had hand motion, was best corrected visual acuity, a single supranasal horseshoe tear uh, from 10 to 11 uh, clock hours. It was a bullous retinal, recmatogenous retinal detachment from 9 to 3. So uh, this is a short video showing where the, the bullous, how bullous was the retinal detachment. Um, this is some pictures from the anterior segment node, red re reflex, and some um, pictures from the posterior pole. Here we can see a, a picture from, from, of the horseshoe tear. I did a uh, cryo first. Um, then I did an AC tap. I got like 0 0.3 cc's on the AC tap. Um, after this, I injected SF6, 0.6, 100% gas. Uh, I'm gonna just fast forward this so you can see the moment where I'm injecting the gas. Unfortunately, I didn't get any fish, uh, fish eggs, but um, it was a continuous, a, a big bubble, a continuous big bubble, so that, that, that was good. Um, this is four hours after uh, macula was attached. Um, the bullous part of the retinal re de detachment was was um, was better, much better. I did laser 48 hours after uh, the gas bubble. We can see uh, this is a one week post op uh, image. Um, I don't have the optos, so I had to take pictures very uh, periphery. There's some um, laser spots and the cryo. Uh, Part, and we had an FAF uh, one week after, 15 days after, and showing uh, Haida. And uh, my short second but, case so is... Uh, we'll, we'll allow uh, our next uh, speaker to show his case because... Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, perfect. His first uh, case, exactly. So, so if you can stop sharing and maybe we can... Sure. To sure. Dr. Eber uh, Garagarza from Mexico. He also wants to share his, uh, his first sure. case as well. Yeah, I share my my screen. So give me a second. So until uh, how how yeah. okay, we can see. Okay, you can see my, yes, my yes. screen? Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Muni, and thank you, Dr. Adol, for the invitation. It's an honor for, uh, to me to share my first case. Um, a 26 years old woman present with a three day history of sudden vision loss on, the, on her, her right eye. She didn't need any trauma. His, her medical history is in it, and only uh, she's a contact lens user for my PIA. And the examination, the red eye, is, her vision is uh, hand motion with a uh, minus uh, 16 sphere. A, and, and the left eye, a uh, visual, a uh, bad visual uh, acuity to 2025 with high myopia. And the anterior chamber and the anterior segment was unremarkable. So uh, this is the photo. In this photo, you can see a, retin a super retinal detachment we, uh, that go from nine o'clock to 20 o'clock. If, if you see this photo on the uh, other projection, you can see two breaks or two, yes, two breaks. One for an lapis de degeneration at 11 o'clock and the other one at uh, one o'clock, as you can see two uh, minus holes contiguous. You can see the macula was detached. So the left eye, uh, she has some breaks, and this is an OCP uh, through the macula. You can see a uh, detachment, and uh, you can see that the, uh, she has a uh, PVD from OCT. So uh, we perform a pneumatic retinal pexy with the a week straight, a uh, uh, 0.3 cc anterior chamber tap, and we inject a uh, 0.6 uh, cc SF6 to 100%. Immediately, immediately the patient uh, was face down for the next uh, six, six hours, and then steamrolling maneuver. 
So this is the photo for the first day. Oh, you can see a lot of fish eggs, but it was my first case. And at the third day, there are some bubbles, but I could to do laser. And to the day seven, you can see the burn light laser. And in the OCT, you can see that macula is reattached, but you can see some cysts in red internal retina and loss of MLE uh, line in this section. This is the photo to the day theory. The, um, the photo you can see the lace the holes all uh, blocked. The retina was fully attached and if you can see the, the right image, you can see the out of four senses from 50-50 grades. And the vision uh, accurate was 20, uh, 2070. The OCT more, more similar to one month ago. So you can see some displacement of the retinal vessels. So uh, this is Hira, this is Lyra. The patient uh, says that she has metamorphosias and necropsias, but the vision is better from the macula, their macula is attached. Thank you uh, very much. <laughs> yes. Thank you very yeah, yeah. for sharing this experience. I appreciate you, you uh, joining us, uh, Dr. Erber. So um, yes, thank you. we have a lot of questions uh, directed to you, Dr. Mooney. And yes. So I'll just start by, by a simple question by Dr. Abdurrahman al Saad. He was asking about what's the, the role of taking the autofluorescence uh, after three months? Uh, is, there, is this the time that you actually see those displacement? Or? Yeah, no, the displacement you can see it much earlier, even at one month. Uh, it's just we've picked a standard time frame to get it. The, the vessel printing, the retinal, we call it retinal vessel printing, will be there for several months, even up to over a year, we know. Uh, and so um, you can see it as soon as you get a view. Now, typically, if you use C3F8 gas or SF6 gas, you know, there's gas in the way. So we've picked three months because that's when the C3F8 bubble will be gone. The, uh, also, they haven't really developed much of a cataract and that tends to be when you can get a good image. But with pneumatic retinopexy, you can even do it at two weeks. And with our minimal gas vitrectomy technique, we've done it at one week. So you can do it anytime. Uh, but this is a, you know, when you're doing research, you want to standardize the protocol. And so we've chosen three months as the optimal time from a visualization perspective to get the image. Uh, questions about the technique. So uh, Dr. Yahya Zahran is asking about uh, uh, how do you do laser uh, uh, afterwards? Do you do LIO, LIO? Do you do just a lamp? And do you recommend doing 360 degree laser or just around the breaks? Uh, that is, that is yeah, so um, the laser is the hardest part about doing pneumatics. It's uh, w what's most challenging, and uh, but it comes very quickly. You know, usually our fellows after one month, they, they're very good at it. And, uh, you know, there's different approaches. One, you want to try to, I like to laser through the bubble because when you're looking through the bubble, the everything is minified and you have a nice clear view often. And so you can laser um, uh, well. The other option, sometimes if the meniscus is in the way, you can change the head position to move the bubble away from where you want to laser. So you can play around with it uh, and, and get it. Uh, often on the first day, they're a little bit tender. So I always put patients on prednisone drops uh, four times a day uh, so that they have less inflammation. And that allows you to have more comfort so that you can uh, do the laser the next day. But sometimes you have to wait till the second day or the third day to get the laser done. Uh, subconjunctival anesthesia is very helpful. Um, you know, when you're starting out, you know, if you have access to cryo in your clinic, that's also a very good approach for small breaks. For bigger breaks, we prefer laser. And in general, we prefer laser. Uh, but cryo makes it very easy because you've already done the treatment around the break and then you inject the bubble. Uh, and sometimes we'll supplement with a barricade uh, in addition to that, but there's no pressure to, to do it because you've already treated the break. Uh, so, uh, you know, those are some of the pearls. The other thing is in pseudophagic patients, you know, when, if you just lie a patient flat on their back, looking up to the ceiling, 
you can get a very nice panoramic view through the bubble uh, where you can almost laser like a full 180 degrees with them just in that one position because the small bubble minifies everything and you get this nice panoramic view uh, there. So it just takes experience, but, uh, but it's, it's very doable. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is one reason many people like to do uh, laser under, under air in, in, in a lot of cases. So a question about, uh, about how, you, how you mark uh, the brakes, I mean, uh, preoperatively, do, do you, um, pre, I mean, uh, pre-injection. Is there a special technique that you use or? Yes. So uh, first of all, it's, you know, we, it's going back to doing very careful examinations. You know, we kind of get spoiled with vitrectomy because it doesn't really matter. You know, you'll find everything in the OR, right? Yeah. Uh, so here you have to go back to the old school way of marking all the breaks and doing a careful uh, diagram so you know where those tears are. So most of the time we can just see the break and treat it. There are two approaches. One, if you have small, small holes, you can actually crank up the laser power and sear the edges of the brake with laser. I don't do that very often. The other technique I find very helpful is to mark the brake in the meridian of the brake at the aura. So what I do is I, if the brake's at 10 o'clock, I'll depress anteriorly where the aura is and I'll laser right there. So I know which line the brake is in and then I'll, I'll laser it. And other times you know that, okay, the break was around 11 and you can just do a, a barricade from you know, 12 to one and you can surround that area. So you know, these are all tricks that you can use, uh, but generally speaking, you know, eventually you get a good view and you can do the treatment, even if it's not on the first day. And what about doing paracentesis? I saw that you, you showed you, you take out around three cc's, uh, three, uh, I mean, a point uh, three. Uh, is, what's, the, what's your rule in, in, in dealing with, with paracentesis? Yeah, I mean, I think the AT paracentesis is the most important part of the procedure, actually, because the larger the gas bubble you can put in, the better you're going to get, um, the greater the chance of achieving retinal reattachment. And um, so I like to take as much as I can. So I'm very careful. I like to go inferiorly over iris with a 30 gauge needle and a TV syringe. And I put the needle so that it's barely, uh, it's, it's into the aqueous. Uh, and I used the opposite side plunger. I took out the plunger from the syringe and I used that to create a dome over the needle. And then I'm applying very firm pressure because not only do I want the aqueous, I also want any liquefied fluid from the back that's like water to come forward and you can do that so sometimes i can remove even 0.6 or 0.7 or 0.8 cc's from the anterior chamber and uh, what we do then is we add 0.3 cc's to that and inject that into the vitreous cavity the one thing you definitely want to be careful when you're starting out is you want to stay over the iris inferiorly you go enter around like five o'clock in a right eye or you know um uh, sorry, five o'clock in a left eye and maybe seven o'clock in a right eye so that you can stay inferior over that iris the whole time because you don't want to nick the lens with the, the needle. That's one thing to be careful about. Um, what about and, pressure, pressure uh, issues uh, after the injections? Do you give uh, Diamox routinely? Do you, well, how do you do it? Well, we don't give anything. Uh, there's no Diamox or drops in 99% in of the cases. Uh, we we'll retap if the pressure is, um, we never check the pressure even actually. So what we do is we inject the gas, then we look at the central artery. If the artery is open, if it's pulsatile, we know that the pressure is high and we'll wait five, 10, 15 minutes. It usually becomes non-pulsatile. And if needed, we'll do an AC tap, uh, a second one. If they're NLP and it's occluded, then we'll do another AC tap, but there's never a rush. You don't have to quickly rush and try to drain the fluid because the chamber will be shallow, you know, because you already decompressed it and now you put a large bubble in the back. So it's gonna make the AC shallow. So you always have time, you know, and you take your time after five, five minutes, the AC will be reformed and then you can uh, go in with the needle. The other tip is when you pull the needle out after doing an AC paracentesis, you want to pull the needle very slowly. If you quickly pull the needle out, the iris will come to that location and you can get iris incarceration. So you want to pull the needle very carefully. But once the, the central artery is patent and it's not pulsatile, you know that the perfusion is fine. And very, very rarely, maybe one out of 200 cases, do you have an issue with eye pressure the next day. So it's very unlikely. And as long as they're seeing out of the eye and you see that the artery is perfused, then you're, you're good. A question from Dr. Sosan Welati. 
she's saying although the stretching by large bubble is a plausible concept how can you not uh, ex i think it's extrapolate the the vitreous separation and removal as a cause uh, if not contributed factor to the retinal replacement uh, displacement yeah, so, you know, we've done, I can talk about this for hours, retinal displacement. So, you know, if uh, maybe I'll come back and, and talk about that one time. But, you know, we've done lots of research on why retinal displacement is happening. And very briefly, uh, basically uh, what happens is that the bubble inside the eye applies a buoyant force to the retina. This buoyant force um, it applies a contact pressure to the retina, causing a bulk flow of fluid uh, inferiorly where there's no gas. And that flow of fluid under the retina is what stretches uh, the retina. The simple process of uh, removing the vitreous does not cause displacement. We do pneumatics in, in vitrectomized eyes, and now we're doing this minimal gas vitrectomy technique where we're removing the vitreous and using a small bubble, and we're not seeing as much retinal displacement. So we know that the simple, the, simply the vitreous removal aspect is not what's, what's causing this uh, from multiple observations uh, that we've had. Um, uh, so I think know, it, I think the following question is something that you've you've you personally uh, uh, like. The question is about uh, retinal displacement following primary scale buckle alone, and if yes, uh, have you compared the, the rate displacement between scale buckle and, and pneumatic? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, we uh, are doing research on that. We're comparing vit buckles versus buckles, and what makes sense to you is what it is. It's the fact that you, you don't want to force the fluid to be re You don't want to intervene. You want the RPE pump to work. So if you do a non-drainage buckle, you're also not going to get retinal displacement. If you do a small bubble pneumatic, you also have a very low rate of retinal displacement. But scleral buckle from a displacement perspective is almost ideal because you are allowing the RPE pump to drain the fluid. Now, if you drain, then it's a different story. And so we're looking at that in more detail. Uh, so the displacement rates with buckle are low. I would say about 12 to 15 percent in the small uh, data set that we have. But uh, we're still researching that more. Uh, but definitely RPE pump-based procedures, pneumatic retinopexy, scleral buckle, are superior to vitrectomy uh, from the perspective of retinal displacement. And what, what about the, the question on, on uh, perfluorocarbon, the belief that using perfluorocarbon would, would, would decrease? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of controversy. I don't know if you want to get into that, but okay. So, you know, um, the, the overall experience in the literature is that with perfluorocarbon liquid, you still see very high rates of retinal displacement. And that makes sense to us for a couple of reasons. You know, we experimented with keeping perfluoron in the eye to see what happens when you put PFO. We, like uh, I was saying, the, the stretch is occurring because of the flow of subretinal fluid under the retina. When you put a heavy liquid on the retina, you're inducing a lot of flow of fluid out through the break. And not surprisingly, that patient I showed you with that very classic example of Lyra, the retina was displaced in the temporal and inferior direction in the same direction that the breaks were. And so PFO, putting the PFO in causes displacement. We know that. Now, when you remove the PFO, we know from intraoperative OCT that you still get significant pockets of subretinal fluid. And so then when you fill the whole eye with gas and the patient sits up or they move around, that fluid is all being pushed by the buoyant force of the bubble to where there's no gas, usually the bottom 1% or 2% of the eye. And that flow of fluid, again, will cause displacement. So in theory, it doesn't make sense that PFO would help very much, except that if you can eliminate all the fluid, minimize the amount of subretinal fluid, that might help you. Uh, there was a randomized control trial uh, comparing PFO versus uh, um, uh, no PFO, but there were significant methodological issues and uh, we're not really sure about the validity of that data. And so um, there, the, I think the jury is still out on that one, whether, whether PFO is better or not. Uh, you know, we're doing more work on that to try to figure it out. But uh, there's been many case series with hundreds of cases where significant PFO was used and you're still getting retinal displacement. So, and Dr. Suleiman, he, 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 he's about to ask a question. Uh, Dr. Suleiman, the mic is yours. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rajiv, uh, for the, thank you. the talk. So, 
Um, I have a question about the JAMA paper. So you had 44% of patients had retinal displacement with vitrectomy. So this uh, group, uh, they had, uh, I assume that they had various methods of uh, retinal detachment repair in terms of BFO versus no BFO, the steroid drainage retinotomy versus peripheral retinotomy. So That's was the subgroup analysis performed? This is one yes. question. The second question, how, many, how much of this 44% uh, were uh, symptomatic? I, I see. Okay. So uh, the first thing is, yes. So we have the JAMA paper. There's also another paper now with prospective data. And we've confirmed that posterior retinotomy versus drainage through the break does not influence retinal displacement. You get it. And that goes along with our theory about why it's happening by the residual fluid. Now, if you minimize the fluid, probably better with posterior retinotomy, hypothetically, you would get less displacement. But in the numbers that we're talking about in the two to 300 cases, we're not finding a significant result. Maybe if you do a thousand cases, we'll get something significant. But um, uh, from the current evidence in that paper and another paper, posterior retinotomy does not help. We just talked about uh, perfluoron and, and you know, again, we're not 100% sure uh, whether that reduces it or not. Um, but most series show that even with PFO, you, you do get it. In the JAMA paper, we had very low rate of PFO, so we can't really comment, but we did have a lot of posterior retinotomy and drainage through the break, and that did not impact. Uh, your second question was the functional outcomes. This is a very complicated question to answer. You know, there's many factors that are affecting the visual acuity and the visual results. Number one, you have the displacement. Number two, you have cataract and other things like that. Number three, even if the retina is not displaced, the interdigitation of the photoreceptors to the RPE may be better when it's naturally being attached with uh, pneumatic retinopexy, which is different than the displacement concept. This is you know, when you have CSR, for example, patients generally recover all their vision because that bleb of fluid is reabsorbed nicely by the RPE. Why not let the RPE do it? When we drain internally, we're causing more, uh, we're causing that retina to be attached more forcefully. And so that interdigitation may be off. Now, when you put all of this together, in the integrity paper that in JAMA, we found less vertical distortion in the uh, pneumatic group compared to the vitrectomy, uh, sorry, in the displaced uh, patients, there was more distortion than, than those that were not. But it's not convincing yet. And I, I still think that the findings that all of these patients are symptomatic. They all say, oh, you know, your, your head looks smaller. You, you know, things are warped or curved. You know, when is it going to get? But I don't think we have yet a great metric to actually quantify and document that. So when we measure anisoconia, we ask them, does this line look straight or not? And for anisoconia, we're looking at the image size differences. Um, what I'm, we're seeing is that there is a, also in, in the new data that we have that what would you expect if the retina got stretched? Well, you expect that the photoreceptors are spaced farther apart. And now because they're spaced farther apart, an object is being visualized as smaller because it's covering less photoreceptors. And so we are seeing that there's a, a trend to, towards anisoconia more. Like next time you see a patient, they say, oh, I, you know, everything looks smaller in the eye that you did operate it on. That there's a high chance that displacement is contributing. The other thing that I want to point out is that autofluorescence is limited in terms of the resolution that you can use to visualize uh, retinal displacement. You can't tell if a tiny little vessel in the macula has also been displaced. With millions of photoreceptors, even with pneumatic retinopexy, there's probably some micro displacement. We know we've measured the degree of retinal displacement. In pneumatics that have displacement, it's usually about 0.1 millimeters. In vitrectomy, it's much more. It's about 0.3 millimeters. So we haven't solved the problem. You know, what I, going back to the beginning of my talk where I said, you know, you, we want to get the best functional outcomes, there's still a long way to go. Uh, but, you know, common sense is that you want the retina back where it was. You don't want it to be in a location that's, you know, 0.5 millimeters away from where it was before. And, and I think that moving towards minimizing displacement is a step in the direction of less functional, out, better functional outcomes. But, you know, we still can't uh, deal with the fact that, you know, the photoreceptors have had some damage from being macula off and, that, and other, other things that occur with the interdigitation that I was talking about. So a I, lot I of- An analogy yeah. about this uh, from one of our fellow, he was saying that 
it's like when when you when you lose weight doing a bariatric surgery and lose a lot of weight quickly you tend to <laughs> to have those skin skin issues so so yeah <laughs> yes. I, it's it's i like that analogy so i wanted to share it so uh before we move to to uh, more practical uh, questions I want to ask about any value of uh, adaptive optics, adaptive optics, and 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 this and and assessing uh, this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're um, now uh, we've uh, we just got the um, approval because it's not Health Canada approved the adaptive optics machine here, uh, but we now have obtained Health Canada approval specifically to look at this specific topic. And so uh, what we're doing is we want to look at the cone density and the spacing between cones. And what I'm expecting to find is that when you have uh, those florets of cones, you're going to see increased space between the cones uh, in the macula. And uh, that the jury is still out on that, but uh, we should have some data hopefully within a year um, on adaptive optics imaging to see if that cone spacing um, is changed. And, and I expect that it would be. So a question, a, a practical question. Uh, some institution uh, only allows this procedure to be done in, in the OR, I mean, for different reasons. Do you think yeah. if you're going to take the patient to the OR, uh, just do a vitrectomy. Uh, so, so, so that, could you not? You can't do it in the office. I just want to add something to that. So, if if you think that this procedure can be done as outpatient, do you think that a surgeon who does pneumatic has to have the setup of a vitrectomy in his facility to be able to do it? Meaning that yeah. the patient comes to you, you do a pneumatic. If it doesn't work, send it to someone else. Is that something that you can you can? So, um, I have a you know. Uh, my wife, actually, she's a medical retina specialist, so she doesn't do surgery, but she does pneumatics. So, uh, but, you know, I will see her, you know, so you have to have a very good relationship. You know, maybe not married, but you have to have a, <laughs> a good relationship with a surgical retina guy in your, in your back pocket, like someone who is okay with that. Um, but, you know, to be honest, like pneumatic retinopexy is not easy. It's actually more complicated than doing a vitrectomy, technically speaking, like, you know, I can sit down and do a three-part parse plane of vitrectomy in my sleep and not have to, you know, worry about lasering through the bubble and this and that. It's much easier and, and kinder to the surgeon to do a vitrectomy because you don't have to examine thoroughly. You can do it all in the operating room. It's done and that's it. But why are we going to this great length? It's because we want the patients to do better. And in fact, I feel like the skill required to do a pneumatic is requires even more training. You need to be extremely good at indirect laser and examining the retina and knowing where all the breaks are and how the fluid moves and all of that. And I, so I, I do think that it's part, it's in the realm of surgical retina. I don't, I wouldn't uh, advise like medical retina people who don't do a lot of peripheral uh, retina to just start injecting bubbles. I think that we could get into some problems uh, with, you know, bad outcomes that way. So I, I really believe that uh, it's part of uh, surgical training to, to do that. Uh, um, other question about the practicality. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, in some countries, they do intravitreal injections in the OR, right? So, I mean, uh, what I would say is the elegance of the procedure is the fact that you can do it outside. You never have to enter the OR. And, you know, if I had to like go to great lengths to get into the OR the first time to do a pneumatic. And then if I thought there was a high risk of failure, you know, then bring them back again, you know, yeah, of course that would impact my decision somewhat for some patients. Uh, but what I would do in that situation, I think is I would have very strict criteria. So use the pivot criteria. If, you know, the, we know that there's 80% and probably for even stricter criteria where you don't have any other pathology and single break, you probably can get 90%. So, you know, in those cases, even if I had to take them to the OR, why would I do a vitrectomy and cause a cataract and higher risk of displacement if I had a 90% chance of that I thought in my practice, in my hands of getting uh, the retina attached. So it really depends on your, your, your confidence with the procedure and, and what the chances are of success and how easy it is to get into the OR and all of that. So... A question or a comment from Dr. Sosan Uelati. She says that uh, it seems like it's time to revive the temporary link of balloon. And that should get rid of all of the, the issues that we're having with this place. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I think Linkoff was a very bright uh, man. And, you know, he uh, realized uh, that non-drainage, uh, drainage was not necessary. And that, you know, a temporary buckle is a very good approach. Uh, so, you know, if someone always says, if it was your eye, what would you want? So Adele, you know, if you had a 12 o'clock detachment, 12 o'clock, let's say a bullet superior detachment with one single break at 12 o'clock and you look like a young guy <laughs> and, uh, and you're in Toronto and there's one surgeon, 
I, I could do a pneumatic. There was Dr. Devenier who could do a vitrectomy and there was Dr. Lem who could do a, a buckle. What would, what would you want? Well, I, I, I think uh, talking for myself, I, w I would be more inclined to do, to do uh, pneumatic. Uh, I think uh, yeah, because you don't want to have phaco surgery. You don't want to have this implant in your eye all the time. And so, if I if I asked myself, what do I want? If I had a nine to three detach uh, any break in the superior clock hour within one clock hour pivot trial, I would want a pneumatic retinopexy. If I had an inferior break, I would want to find someone who does lots of primary buckles and have them do a very localized um, either radial sponge or a small segmental buckle. You know, the, the times are changing now. Going in and doing a huge vitrectomy buckle for a single break at 12 o'clock is not in the best interest of our patients. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed this talk, and I'm sure a lot of our, uh, our colleagues uh, done. Uh, okay, so, so, no, Dr. Sanson-Anirati says, says, yeah, she, she would have the gas bubble as well. <laughs> so uh, she, she's, our, she's um, our, our senior uh, 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 a very delightful and very nice uh, colleague, and she, we really, really love her here. So I, I would take this opinion as well. Uh, I really thank you for this time. I know that you're in the middle of a, of a clinic, and uh, no. it's a hectic time for you. I really appreciate you gave it this time. This yeah. time. And uh, by this, I think we, we can conclude our session. And I th want to thank you all for, for being here. So yes, and the last thing I'd like to say, I thank sure. you for the kind in, in, invitation and uh, uh, just take us up on that offer. Let Adele know, you know, <laughs> we have this very lively uh, group and you can uh, be involved and, and do your first cases, you know, so I encourage you to join. Absolutely. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll add you to the group as soon as you give me a call or, or a text. Very take good. Care, thank you all. Take care. Bye -bye. All the best.